Good afternoon, everyone, and apologies for the delay of this uh, press conference. I need to take off my mask, sorry. So um, we are welcoming you to this virtual press briefing from the European Medicines Agency in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Today, our Human Medicines Committee, the CHMP, has recommended a conditional marketing authorization for a third COVID-19 vaccine for the EU market. This press briefing aims at providing you with some background about the assessment of this vaccine, how it works, and how we will monitor the safety of the vaccine in the coming months and years. My name is Marie Agnes Heine, I'm, and I am the head of the communication department at EMA. I'm delighted to have with me our executive director, Ima Cook. Ima will give you an update on where we stand with the development and evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines and how we also contribute together with our European and international partners to the global fight against the pandemic. We also have with us Professor Bruno Sepodis, the Vice Chair of EMA's Human Medicines Committee, CHMP, and he will provide you with details of the assessment of this specific vaccine and the data that allowed the committee to recommend this vaccine for a marketing authorization. We also are happy to have with us Dr. Sabine Strauss. She is the chair of EMA Safety Committee, the PRAC, and she will tell you more about the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine and about the measures that are being taken to ensure a continuous monitoring of the vaccine and possible side effects as it is rolled out across Europe. I'm also very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Marco Cavalleri, from EMA who can provide you further technical detail if needed. Before we start, I would like to explain to you how we plan to run this press briefing. So please note that your microphone is disabled by default for the duration of the press briefing. We will first hear short remarks from Mrs. Cook, Professor Sepodes and Dr. Strauss. And after that, we will have about half an hour for questions. Once the question and answer session starts, your hand in Webex, <clears throat> you need to raise your hand in Webex if you want to ask a question. To raise your hand, you will have to click on the icon next to your name in the list of participants. When I will give you the floor, you will be prompted on your screen to unmute yourself. We would appreciate if you would switch on your camera when you are asking a question. Please note that today's briefing is being broadcast via YouTube and also Europe by satellite. The footage can be used free of charge by all media. You will find the respective links in the invite sent yesterday. As we have just 45 minutes for today's briefing, I'm now handing over to Ima. Ima, please. Thank you, Marie and yes, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here and to announce the third positive opinion for the authorization of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. This expands the range of vaccines available to EU and EEA member states, uh, which will all help to bring the pandemic under control and protect the citizens of the EU. Tomorrow, on the 30th of January, it will be exactly a year since the World Health Org Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak to be a public health emergency of international concern. This has been a difficult year for many it's, and has caused a lot of hardship, not just in Europe, but across the globe. But let's not forget that this year has seen progress at an unprecedented scale and speed in scientific terms. We now have three vaccines that have been developed and recommended for approval against a disease that we did not know one year ago. None of them is perfect. None of them has all the characteristics that we might want in a, in, to, to help us, to allow us to move completely forward. None of them is a magic wand on its own, but together they provide tools and options to prevent different aspects of the disease. Promising results are also reported from another of other, a number of other vaccine developers, as well as in the therapeutic area. The unprecedented scientific 
development is the result of unparalleled mobilization of scientists, industry, regulators, healthcare professionals, patient representatives, and public health bodies across the globe. Every day we learn more about this disease and we need to continue to work hard to get more vaccines and treatments available to help beat the pandemic step by step, product by product, mutation by mutation. The recommendation adopted by the CHMP today is for a conditional marketing authorization and brings with it all the safeguards, controls and obligations. This authorization is valid across across Europe, allowing all member states, big or small, to profit from the joint work that has been performed at EU level. It provides a controlled and robust legal framework for pharmacovigilance, manufacturing controls and other post-approval obligations. This means that there are legally binding obligations for, on the company for continuing monitoring and updates. The recommendation to approve the AstraZeneca Zeneca vaccine is based on data that shows that the vaccine offers protection against COVID-19 with a reassuring safety profile. While the first two approvals were for messenger RNA vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine is based on another technology. It's an adenovirus-based vaccine. This, this means that the vaccine uses a common virus from the adenovirus family that has been modified to carry a portion of the COVID-19 coronavirus called the spike protein. Adenovirus vectored vaccines are easier to handle than mRNA vaccines in terms of transport and storage, and this should simplify the logistics of rolling the vaccine out across the EU and hopefully can provide a boost to vaccinations in the member states. But let me stress, manufacture of all vaccines is complicated. Technology transfer can be, uh, may be complex and may raise unanticipated issues. And we've all seen reports of production and supply challenges. We've heard many voices questioning the time that has been taken for the evaluation of this vaccine. As many of you know, in early October, this was the first vaccine we started to evaluate through the rolling review process, a practice whereby data is reviewed on an iterative basis. But evaluation of vaccines is not a first in, first out process. The review timelines vary because between vaccines as they are dependent on the data becoming available during the ongoing development and the results of ongoing trials. This was a complex data package, including pooled results from four clinical trials, and this made assessment challenging. And you'll hear, some, uh, you'll hear more about some of the challenges today. But our experts have scrutinized the data, raised questions, and in fact, we're receiving large data packages right up to the start of this week. Discussions on the best wording to reflect the data outcomes were finalized in the last sessions of the committee meeting, which finished less than one hour ago. In the end, the committee reached an independent scientific opinion, a solid scientific conclusion by consensus. Now, let me stress that our work does not stop here. The safety and effectiveness of this vaccine will continue to be very closely monitored as it is rolled out across the member states and also globally. We're monitoring very closely the variants of the coronavirus which are emerging across the world and whether and how they affect the protection offered by this and the other vaccines. We do not yet have data on whether the AstraZeneca vaccine offers protection against the new variants, but we have requested the company to investigate this as we have done for the other vaccines. In addition, we're working with regulatory authorities across the world to determine what new data would be needed in case changes to the composition of COVID-19 vaccines might be, need to be made to offer protection against the new variants. Looking ahead, we are acutely aware of the urgency to have many vaccines to cover the needs, not only, for, not only of Europeans, but of people across the world who are suffering as a result of this pandemic. And we will continue to work hard to play our part in fulfilling these needs, together with Member States, the European Commission and our international partners. Many other vaccines are in development. 
We've just heard some promising results from the Janssen vaccine, uh, which we hope to be submitted uh, uh, shortly to us. Uh, this, is su this is currently subject to a rolling review, which precedes the formal marketing authorization application um, submission. But many other vac COVID-19 vaccines are un under development and under review by EMA on a preliminary basis. But there also remains an urgent need to have treatments for patients who have COVID-19. Several therapeutics are also in the pipeline and we have had interactions with over 180 developers. Many of these are likely to come for EU authorization later this year. And this is very important because hundreds of, of Europeans, hundreds and thousands of Europeans who have been infected with the virus uh, um, need to, we need solutions for, for these and of course morbidity and mortality remains very high. Even with the rollout of, an effect, of effective vaccines, there will be, continue to be a need for effective treatments. One year on, we know there are no silver bullets, but there are significant steps and milestones that have been and can be delivered. And these are necessary to multiply the options available for healthcare systems. Today's achievement will deliver yet another option. Let me now hand back to Marianne Yes to continue our discussion. Many thanks, Ima. And I'm now handing over immediately to Professor Bruno Sepodes, the Vice Chair of the CHMP. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria Nies, and good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to be able to explain on behalf of the EMA's Human Medicines Committee, the CHMP, our recommendation and our assessment of the COVID-19 vaccine on AstraZeneca that was concluded in the last hour. After reviewing, re reviewing all the evidence that was submitted by the applicant, the committee has recommended that the COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca should be approved for the prevention of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19 from now on, in people aged 18 years and older. Our, our recommendation is being sent to the European Commission for a formal authorization. This vaccine is administered in two injections, usually into the muscle of the upper arm, and the product information, as you will see, recommends that the second dose should be administered after four and within 12 weeks after the first dose. This is to say roughly 28 to 84 days after the first dose, given the data that we had access to. The CHMP opinion is based on evidence from four clinical trials that were conducted uh, in the United Kingdom, two of them, and in Brazil and South Africa. The four studies involved around 24,000 people altogether, half received the vaccine and half were given control injections containing saline solution or another vaccine with a similar platform. People did not know if they had been given the vaccine or the control injection. The vaccine showed a 59.5% reduction in the number of symptomatic COVID-19 cases in people given the vaccine. Being more specific, 64 out of 5,258 5, people got COVID-19 with symptoms compared with people given dummy injections where 154 out of 5,210 people got COVID-19 with symptoms. As Emmer said, the committee was confronted with some challenges while evaluating this vaccine. And these challenges were mainly related to the circumstances regarding the clinical trials. While we managed to clarify these points after thorough assessment, I will highlight a few issues. Firstly, since a predefined number of COVID-19 cases, which was considered necessary to estimate the efficacy of the vaccine, was only reached in two of the four studies, the CHMP based its calculations on how, of how well the vaccine worked on the results from study COV-002 conducted in the UK and study COV-003 conducted in Brazil. Secondly, as the vaccine is expected to be given as two standard doses, four to 12 weeks apart, the CHMP considered only results involving people who received this standard regimen. This vaccine is recommended for all age groups above 18 years old, 
13% of patients in the studies were 65 years or older. However, protection in this population is expected based on their immune response and results in younger participants and people given similar vaccines. One important aspect to highlight is that the longer dosing interval from four to up to 12 weeks between the first and the second dose for this vaccine will allow flexibility and will help the ongoing immunization campaigns in the EU. The extended dosing schedule is based on data from the clinical trials where a greater range of dosing intervals were studied. This vaccine can be safely administered to people who've had COVID already, as there were no additional side effects in volunteers who received COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca in the trial and had previously been infected with COVID-19. We don't know yet whether the vaccine can reduce transmission of the virus from one person to the next. For this, we need large-scale observation studies in millions of people, which will be carried out in the context of the vaccination campaigns. We also don't know yet how long the protection lasts. We will get data on this by following up closely on the people who were vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca for at least one year. CHMP will also evaluate data from an ongoing study in the US that has enrolled a very large number of volunteers, approximately 30,000, and, and results from these studies are expected towards the end of the first quarter of this year, and will add to the evidence available on the safety and efficacy of this vaccine. This study, importantly, includes a substantial cohort of elderly people. There has been a lot of attention on recently discovered mutations of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We have no reason to believe that the vaccine would not be effective against the mutation, but we will need to monitor closely and to have more data. In any case, we are already considering how possible strain changes could be handled from a regulatory point of view. We know that the two mRNA-based vaccines already approved uh, for use in the EU are relatively easy to modify if necessary. We believe that the same could apply for AstraZeneca's vac vaccine. We are ready to evaluate these changes, should they be necessary, as quickly as possible. Our experts uh, are already looking into this and are providing guidance uh, on what evidence would be needed. There are very limited data on use in pregnant women but we expect a protective effect from this vaccine. Taking into account that pregnancy in itself constitutes a risk for a factor for severe COVID-19 and that pregnant women may additionally belong to other risk groups, vaccination may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and after consulting a healthcare professional. There are no data for breastfeeding uh, women, but based on preclinical studies and the evidence we have gathered, we don't anticipate any risk. It is a key feature of the conditional marketing authorization as highlighted by Emmer that we can require that more data will be collected on the use of the vaccine in special populations after the authorization. So pregnant and breastfeeding women will be key areas of focus, as will be people who are immunocompromised. No participants with severe immunodeficiency were included in the studies after considering that the overall safety of the vaccine and the risk of developing severe COVID-19 is particularly high in this population, we recommend its use. As for any new medicine that is evaluated for use in the EU, EMA has agreed a pediatric investigation uh, plan, a PIP, with the, the Pediatric uh, uh, Medicines Committee to make sure that we can gather more data on the use of this vaccine in children through clinical trials. Overall, after evaluation of all available data, the CHMP has agreed by consensus that the benefits of this vaccine outweigh the known and any potential risks and has recommended granting a marketing authorization. And I am pleased to hand back to Maria Agnes. Thank you very much, Bruno. And I'm now handing over to Dr. Sabine Strauss, the chair of the PRAC. Sabine, please. Thank you very much, Marie Agnes, and good afternoon, everyone. EMA Safety, Safety Committee, the Pharmacovigilance Risk, Risk Assessment Committee, in short, the PRAC, 
is very much aware of its responsibility to the EU citizens to collect and analyze every piece of information on the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine, as with all the COVID-19 vaccines, to be able to provide continuous reassurance that the benefits of the vaccines outweigh the risks. All medicines, including vaccines, have side effects, and a robust pharmacovigilance system is in place in the European Union to collect and promptly evaluate any safety signal that may arise during the vaccination campaigns. The prox focus throughout this current evaluation process is the risk management plan for the AstraZeneca vaccine. The risk management plan contains firstly, or describes firstly, the safety profile of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Uh, secondly, all measures needed in order to ensure the best possible benefit risk. And thirdly, all studies and data collections that are put in place in order to ensure its ongoing safety monitoring. What do we know at this moment in time of the safety of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine? As we have heard from Professor Sopedis, um, the clinical trials submitted provide a good set of safety data. And approximately 12,000 participants have already received the vaccine. The safety profile identified from these clinical trials is in line with what we expect from a vaccine. As with the other COVID vaccines, also with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, a very serious um, allergic reaction, anaphylaxis, may occur. Fortunately, that is a very, very rare uh, adverse event. And the vaccine should therefore be administered under close medical observation and appropriate medical treatment should be available. People who have received the vaccination should be monitored for at least 15 minutes after the vaccination. The most common side effects uh, were um, pain and uh, redness at the injection site, headache, tiredness, um, pain in the muscles and the joints, headache, uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. These uh, adverse events were often were mostly mild and didn't last very long. So based on the data that we have from the clinical trials, the safety profile is reassuring. Nevertheless, careful surveillance remains very important now that the vaccine will be rolled out in real life setting and in large numbers of people. Safety is key and it is important that if any new or changing risks are identified, we detect them immediately and act, uh, take action. Today's opinion recommending a marketing authorization for the AstraZeneca vaccine means that EMA and AstraZeneca will continue to collect uh, data uh, in order to ensure that the safety of the vaccine is actively monitored. The core safety requirements for the AstraZeneca vaccine are the same strict and rigorous requirements that apply to all medicines and all vaccines in Europe. In addition to the usual tools, additional resources have been mobilized to monitor and assess new safety information as it becomes available. The standard information sources include the information from all the studies, information from other regulators, and very importantly, reports of suspected side effects from people who have received the vaccination, as well as the healthcare professionals. Strengthened obligations uh, for the reporting are in place for all COVID vaccines and also for this AstraZeneca vaccine. The marketing authorization holder has to submit monthly reports in addition to the regular updates in line with the uh, pharmacovigilance legislation. To give you a comparison, normally safety updates are requested every six months. These monthly safety reports are published on EMA's website, and today the first one has been published and, uh, regarding the uh, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. And although large numbers of people have received the vaccine in the clinical trials, and these people will be uh, 
followed up as part of these studies, no study can ever be large enough or go on long enough to identify very rare side effects. They are just too uncommon. So to ensure that we identify new or changing side effects, the EU has an excellent safety surveillance system in place with state-of-the-art analysis and detection. And I would like to take this opportunity to encourage people who have been vaccinated to report um, uh, the uh, suspected side effects um, they may experience and also their healthcare professionals to report any side effects they note, which will then be collected and analyzed throughout the European pharmacovigilance system. As a last point, I would like to highlight that in addition to the studies AstraZeneca will need to perform as requested in the risk management plan, EMA has commissioned independent studies to monitor the safety of all the COVID vaccines in real life setting after their authorization. And these studies will be performed in collaboration with other regulators worldwide. I thank you very much. I would like to hand back to our moderator. Many thanks, Sabine, and many thanks to Bruno and Ima. And we are now taking questions from the floor. So if you wish to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon next to your name in the participant list in WebEx. And then when I give you the floor, you will be asked on your screen to unmute yourself. And then you can start by stating your name and affiliation. So we have the first question now from Gillian Deutsch from Politico. Gillian, please. Hi, thank you. Yes, my name is Gillian Deutsch and I work for Politico. I have three questions. Um, the first is about how um, German scientists yesterday said that there was not enough evidence to recommend the vaccine for use in people over the age of 65. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on why the EMA in Germany came to different conclusions. Um, my second question is about the 59% efficacy rate. I just want to be sure this is because the EMA really evaluated the efficacy rate based on two of those clinical trials, not all four. Um, my third question um, is about the initial half dose um, that was administered for about 1,300 patients accidentally in one of the UK studies. I was wondering if the EMA evaluated that at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll ask um, Bruno to respond to all three questions and perhaps then Marco can complement. Yes, please, Bruno. Thank you so much. Thank you for these very, very good questions. I will start with the first one, the age, um, the, the indication uh, that we currently are uh, approved and, and adopt as a consensus opinion of CHMP relates to all citizens above 18 years old. And this uh, question regarding what is happening with the six, uh, over 65. Well, in fact, it's very clear and you will get the information from CHMP that is in the assessment report, but also in the product information. We don't have much information uh, on the efficacy over 55 years old, but there is data and, and some of the patients, as you pro probably heard, I mentioned that 13% of the patients that we included in our analysis were in fact elderly patients. Um, the, so based what we know and the reason why we are still recommending the use in this age group is that based on the immunogenicity data available for this age group and on the experience we've gathered also from the previous vaccines, at least some protection is expected in this uh, subgroup, um, although the exact uh, level of protection cannot be estimated for the time being. And this does not collide with what was actually uh, communicated yesterday in one or the other member state. This is to say that it, it can be used if there are other options, those could be preferred in specific situations. Truth um, be told is exactly this one. There is no reason to expect that this would not have some level of efficacy in that, in that age group. Uh, regarding the efficacy uh, question, I believe it related to the, the, so the calculations that were made 
really uh, come from the data from two of those four studies. So we use the four studies, the, the entire package, the two UK studies, the Brazil one and the South African for the safety da database, but we use for the efficacy calculations only the two trials um, that uh, where we, we had uh, 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 clear efficacy data to, to analyze. And another thing, and important, this is related to your third question, the half dose. One of the reasons was that we wanted to, to ex we consider that, that was extensively discussed with the EMA throughout the rolling review, one of the advantages of the rolling review, but there were so many confounders uh, uh, when we wanted to determine the efficacy of these patients that were treated initially with the low dose and then with the standard dose, that that those patients were excluded from our calculations. So what we what the CHMP concluded on is or relates to patients who received a standard dose followed by a second standard dose. Um, but I would also like to give the floor to Marco to to complete my 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 comments. Yeah, th thank you, Bruno. Indeed, not much to add. As you rightly said, uh, we were sticking exactly to what has been proposed as a claim for the use of this vaccine uh, in a vaccination campaign for COVID-19, which is indeed uh, giving two doses with an interval of four to 12 weeks, and these two doses are standard doses. So therefore, we felt important excluding uh, those subjects that receive an initial low dose, because this would be a confounder as this uh, is not a dose that is going to be used at all uh, in terms of, of use of this vaccine in vaccination campaign, but really sticking to the data that pertain to what is approved and what is recommended. And of course, this led also to a reduction in the number of uh, subjects included in the various trials, also uh, to mention that uh, uh, studies in which there were less than five cases of COVID-19 identified were to be excluded from the pooled analysis. And that's why we ended up essentially limiting these pooled analysis to the Brazilian and the UK study and focuses on in the interval four to 12 weeks. Many thanks to both of you. The next question comes from Yanis Palaiologos from Katimerini in Greece. Yanis, please. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Yanis Palaiolos from Kathimerini newspaper in Greece. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, one is, is, do you have numbers for how efficacious, how effective the vaccine is after one dose, given that, uh, you know, if, if they can wait as, as, as long as 12 weeks, then that allows many more people to, to get a first dose. And secondly, has there been an agreement on uh, foregoing the translation of the manuals in, in all the languages of the EU so that the doses can be delivered faster? And is there a date that you can tell us about for the delivery of the, of the doses? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question is for Bruno. Bruno, can you please respond? Yes. Um, there is some evidence of protection approximately three weeks after the first dose of the vaccine, and it persists uh, up to 12 weeks. Uh, but again, uh, as per the, the license uh, that we are now giving to the product, we expect that the second dose is given to complete the vaccination scheme. So there is some efficacy obtained after one dose, but um, but it, we start seeing efficacy after three weeks. But again, this does not preclude the need for the second injection. But Marco probably might might also add some more information. No, indeed, as you say, Bruno, the problem is that it's very difficult to quantify exactly what is the protection of a first dose up to the period of 12 weeks, as indeed uh, the clinical trials, uh, in the clinical trial, the second dose was given at different uh, intervals, uh, and this was not predefined, which makes very difficult in the two studies, so both the Brazilian and the, the UK one, to have uh, at this point in time a precise estimate of what is the protection of a single dose up to 12 weeks. However, the data that we are seeing are rather reassuring on the fact that sufficient amount of protection is already achieved from a single dose. 
Uh, and a second dose is very important because it will increase also the immune response and will uh, give additional protection. Many thanks, Marco. And regarding the translation of the product information, I can perhaps uh, let you know that we are translating all the product information as usual, and this will also be published on our website. So uh, it's only not possible in that very short time frame to do all the translations immediately. Okay, our next question is from um, Anja Ettel from German Daily Die Welt. Anja, please. Yes, hello, my name is Anja Ettel from Die Welt and Welt am Sonntag. I have a follow-up to uh, the questions from Julian, um, because vaccination is, has a lot to do with trust. And don't you fear that there will be a lot of mistrust now that you recommend the use of a vaccine that has been limited in some EU countries, and while you still don't know how effective it can be for the elderly? And, um, we had some reports here in Germany that the effectiveness for older people was under 10%. Could you um, exclude that it is as low? Thanks a lot. Many thanks, Anja. Um, Bruno, can you perhaps respond to that one? Yes, I, I will start, but I will, I will also uh, refer to Marco for a more detailed numbers. I think, I think here the, the important thing is to consider that the addition of a therapeutic tool uh, in, in the management of this pandemic. And again, um, there is, although the studies didn't allow us, CHMP, to reach a conclusion now, the, uh, we will soon get it because not only the, the trial that is ongoing, and that's another advantage of the conditional marketing authorization, is that we have this as a condition, uh, that we have more data from the trial that is ongoing in the US where we have a significant proportion of elderly uh, uh, involved in, in the trial. Um, from, the, from what we have uh, uh, as evidence, we don't have reasons to believe that this would not be an, uh, um, probably useful in this population. So we could be criticized either ways, either by restricting a valid tool or uh, as we are probably uh, uh, talking now by ac accepting it. And it's it's our opinion that there is no, as I just mentioned a while ago, there, uh, looking at the data that we have available and the experience that we have gathered with other vaccines, we expect in this population uh, some protection. Included in the product information that you will receive and that will be published, you will also find a few numbers that were added specifically on the numbers uh, um, of cases that were found both in the treated group and in the control group in the population that is between the 56 years old and the 65 and also the 65 and above. But for, for more precise figures, perhaps, Marco, could you, could you help? Yeah, f thanks, Bruno. I think uh, you said very clearly where we stand with this. Essentially, we don't have uh, exact figures uh, to tell us what is the efficacy in subjects that are older than 65 years of age at this point in time, because too few cases were identified in the clinical trials and there were a limited amount of subjects above 65 or even 55 uh, years of age included in the trial. So we are looking forward uh, receiving more information from the studies that are ongoing in order to better define what would be this level of efficacy in the elderly. But uh, as you rightly said, the level of immunogenicity is uh, really similar to what we've seen in adults, which is extremely reassuring. And knowing how vaccines work, it would tell us that there will be some level of protection comfort also in elderly above 65 years of age. The only problem that we cannot really say how much uh, this is going to be and whether there will be any differences as seen with the adults. So. Uh, looking forward to more data, but important that uh, in, uh, in a pandemic like this one, we as regulator identified the population for which the benefit risk is deemed positive and allow the use of this vaccine in countries according to what will be the national recommendations. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Susie Ring from Bloomberg. Susie, please. Hi there. Susie Ring from Bloomberg here. Can you hear me? Yes, we uh, can. Two hear questions. 
One, thank you, was on the dosing interval, as you say, there were a number of different intervals given across the trial. I think it was between four and 26 weeks. So you've obviously focused on the four to 12. AstraZeneca has said it's going to give uh, do more studies on the interval to try and fine tune this. Do you have any information as to when you might receive more information about the optimum interval? Um, and secondly, was the decision unanimous among the CHMP or was it a majority decision? And what was the split if the latter? Thank you. Many thanks, and I think these two questions are for Bruno. Bruno, please. Thank you so much, and thank you for, again for these good for these very good questions. The first one, well, you you will find in the again in the package that will be public, uh, uh, you will find information that there there was in fact we considered the the. Um, uh, different intervals and there is a, a an analysis that in fact considers the long range from three weeks to 23 weeks the reason why we chose this interval and the reason why the product is licensed for use in this specific interval was because uh, when looking at the two trials that we based our opinion on 86 percent of the patients actually had uh, a, a dosing interval between four and 12 weeks. So it's a strong majority. Uh, and again, the of these patients, they had both received the standard dose. Um, so, so, so this was one of the reasons. You will find data there. Probably other uh, regimens will be uh, submitted, but I prefer to see them first. Uh, uh, so I, 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 again, Marco might add on precise dates or expectations, but I will not, especially based on the difficulty that was uh, to actually get all the, the information we wanted to have this ready for today. So the, regarding the opinion, I can assure you that it was, there were long debates, um, but it was a consensus opinion, which means that every member state plus Iceland and Norway voted positive uh, for a recommendation of marketing authorization. Um, sorry to abuse the patience of Marco, but would you like to add something? No problem, Bruno. Uh, and, and indeed, as you rightly said, the problem here is that we don't have a sufficient amount of data behind the 12 weeks interval. And uh, they become thinner and thinner the more you go behind this, uh, this point in time. Uh, so there will be a need for more studies in order to determine whether a longer interval could be more suitable than the one that has received approval now. Thank you. The next question is from Ludwig Burger from Reuters. Ludwig, please. Ludwig, do you hear us? Otherwise, let's take uh, Frank Jordans from AP first. Frank, do you hear us? Yes, I do. Uh, so I'd also like to um, ask uh, a question about the use of the vaccine in over 65s. Um, now, does EMA currently recommend that those over 65 should, under the current circumstances, be given the other approved vaccines where available, given their proved rather than assumed efficacy? Because most people won't be particularly reassured by you saying that you assume some protection in the older age groups. And uh, for Ms. Cook, um, what does it say about the EMA approval process in general if shortly after um, your decision, some countries were to decide to adopt slightly other recommendations? Thank you very much. I give this uh, question to Imur. Thank you very much. And I think really to come back to what Bruno said, and it was about having options available. We are not making a recommendation. We are saying that according to the information we have and the scientific evaluation, it can be used in patients over sick, uh, well, patients over 18, but it, um, and we're not restricting it to under 55s. And this is based on the evidence in the trials, the safety profile, and the immunogenicity uh, that shows an expectation of, of effect in older populations. Um, I think uh, with respect 
sorry, no, I missed the second question. There was, a there was only one question. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, I think it's really come back. It's, it's about options and it's about um, making sure that when uh, when countries are looking at what uh, what they need and what the profile of their uh, population is, that they have these options available to them. Thank you, Imer. And the next question now we try again. Uh, Ludwig from Reuters. Ludwig, do you hear us now? If still not, we can take the question from Yuri Sheku, I think a freelance journalist. Yuri? Uh, hello, no, I'm from Deutsche Welle. Uh, so, Yuri Sheko, Deutsche Welle. I have uh, two questions. First question is a follow up on this half dosage. Can you explain why uh, half dosage was not um, considered, was not taken into consideration? Because now this uh, number of 59% efficacy stays, and I understand many people can look and say, yeah. Why should I take this uh, vaccine with efficacy of 59% when there are with 95%? And the second question, uh, AstraZeneca has announced e that it will try to combine its vaccine with uh, Russian vaccine Sputnik uh, V or Sputnik V. Uh, so can you say is uh, this, uh, I mean, is this com Com combining of these two vaccines, is it a part of your review of AstraZeneca vaccine? And also, while we are here, can you say what is the state of play of uh, review of uh, Sputnik vaccine? Because uh, Russia has uh, applied, as far as I understand, for, for, the, for the authorization as well, while its first, its, its third phase trial was not finished and practically aborted because they started giving uh, also vaccine to people in control group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri. And um, I think the first two questions are for Bruno and the last question Marco can take. Please, Bruno. Okay, so Marco takes the, the Sputnik one. Um, I think uh, what is important here is you, as the, the, we could not use the data that we had on the low dose um, as I told you, due to very various confounders that make it very difficult to calculate accurately vaccine efficacy. This said, um, we, we took it out of, of the equation and used only, um, the again, the patients who were administered with a standard dose twice. Um, so the figures that we've reached now are the, the figures that should be considered uh, as official figures because they reflect exactly what we have assessed. And, and, and again, I think uh, we are probably being too, too uh, caught up in numbers. Uh, uh, as, a, as, a far, uh, as a public health tool, 59.5% of efficacy is relevant, uh, especially uh, when when you have to deal with other options or, or the lack of other options in this case. Um, so there's still, and there is clearly a population in the EU that will be, and in the, in the world that will benefit from this, uh, from this uh, uh, tool. Um, regarding the, uh, there was, there was a second question on the data, whether we, uh, you know, we looked at the data together with the Sputnik because they wanted to oh, combine. Yes, Re of course, regarding that, and, and I will handle uh, then to Marco on the Sputnik. Regarding that, we did not consider that in our assessment, not only because uh, we, that was not part of the dossier. Uh, we understand those could be expectations of the, of the, um, of the AstraZeneca, but we did not take that into consideration currently for this assessment. Uh, although uh, uh, we understand it's being it's being discussed, but I hand over to Marco. Yeah, in, indeed, uh, uh, this uh, is uh, an interesting study, which uh, uh, we understand uh, will be uh, ongoing very soon. And uh, we, of course, we are very much open to discuss options of uh, so-called heterologous prime boost strategy, in which you give one vaccine at the beginning and then you boost with a different one. This is a strategy that could provide advantages, so we are very much open to discuss whether this approach might be a very suitable 
one in order to increase protection against COVID-19. With respect to uh, the Gamaleya uh, vaccine, uh, we are in discussion with them and we are undergoing a procedure of scientific advice in which we will be discussing many aspects related to their uh, vaccine development, including particularly the clinical development, and will be a great opportunity to have a better understanding of which data have been generated and will be generated with this vaccine to see whether it will be possible also to have an approval in the European Union. Thanks, Marco. And we are now coming to our last question, which we take from Ludwig Burger, who came through via the chat because his microphone obviously did not work. So he is asking, can you recommend using adenovirus vector vaccines like AstraZeneca's product for repeat booster shots over time, given the discussion over vector immunity? Uh, I'll ask Marco to respond to that question. Marco, please. Yeah, I, I think uh, indeed it's very important to look carefully at uh, the uh, uh, immunity towards the vector as well. Uh, what we know with the two doses that are uh, envisaged here for administration with the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, this is not a problem, so there is no problem with the uh, immunity towards the vector. We don't know what could happen if you administer a third or a fourth dose of the uh, vector vaccine using the same adenovirus. And, and therefore, this is something that will have to be explored later on if there is a need of further boosting of this vaccine. And in this sense, uh, the approach of the heterologous boosting using a different vector could be a very important way forward in case we see problem. But of course, at this stage, that's all we can say. Many thanks, and thanks to all the journalists who attended this press briefing. If you have any further questions, please contact our press office at the usual email address, press at ema.europa.eu. But please also check out our website, because here you will find a lot of comprehensive and useful information on the development, evaluation, and safety monitoring of COVID-19 vaccines and medicines. So thanks again, and goodbye to all of you. Bye-bye.